Hi guys, this is Jody. We are going to talk about cognition and specifically the exemplar of Alzheimer disease. And so when you think about this and when you're studying, always look at your learning outcomes. They're basically the same for the exemplars that we teach throughout the fourth semester. So really concentrate on the nursing focus, um, interventions, um, there isn't a lot of pathophysiology with Alzheimer disease, which is kind of nice. It's pretty um, simple. There aren't a lot of medications either, but there are a couple um, that I did note it, that I did note on this PowerPoint. So pay attention to those. Um, and anyway, let's jump into it. So we'll talk about a quick overview of Alzheimer disease. It is very prevalent in society. Um, Obviously, they're just thinking there's going to be more and more numbers, um, you know, as the years progress. So they're looking at close to 7 million cases by 2025. Um, when I think of Alzheimer's disease, I think about it as organ failure. So we have all sorts of organ failure. We have heart failure and kidney failure and liver failure. Well, there's deterioration in the brain and there is a little bit of pathophysiology that we'll talk about specific to Alzheimer disease, but generally it's a failure of the brain. Um, it's the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. So very often we think about, you know, the early to moderate stages of Alzheimer disease where people start to become forgetful, um, but you can see that it's going to progress to, to the point where um, the brain and the motor function in the brain is going to be affected. So you can have patients that become bed bound um, and can't really get up and walk or move anymore. So if you haven't watched Amy's story yet, I gave you guys that video to watch. It's a really good one um, to watch to kind of see the progression um, that she goes through with Alzheimer's disease. It usually manifests after the age of 65, so we generally think of older people as having Alzheimer's disease, but if you watched Amy's story or if you haven't yet, you will see that it can affect younger people as well. Some may experience symptoms in their 30s, and they can live up to two decades with the disease. So you can have people very chronically ill or needing a lot of services and a lot of help um, because of their Alzheimer's disease. Most individuals will survive four to eight years after diagnosis, and they're going to spend most of the time of that disease in the moderate stage. Okay, and we'll talk more about the stages. The big thing that you guys have to think about is we always talk about the patient, but when you have a patient like this who might, you know, in the early to moderate stages be physically functioning, but not, they don't have the appropriate judgment, they really aren't independent. Well, that creates this huge caregiver burden. So we'll talk about that as well. So the pathophysiology, like I said, there's not a lot of stuff to know here. Um, you can have that early onset that manifests before the age of 65. You can have late onset, which is more common. Um, that's after 65. There are genetic and environmental factors that appear to be involved. We could talk a little bit about those. The two characteristic abnormalities are these neurofibrillary tangles, which are thick protein clots that they can find in the brain, and the amyloid plaque. But generally, when you have somebody coming in who is having these neurological deficits, they're going to rule out a bunch of other stuff before they just throw a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease out there. Okay. So what you get when you have these um, plaque buildups in the, in the brain, um, you have kind of death of brain areas, um, you will start to see emotional problems, loss of memory, and again, it can progress to the point where they can't function physically anymore either. So risk factors, non-modifiable um, age, um, after the age of 85, the risk increases by 50%. Um, and you know that as people age, we start to see that brain deteriorate. and We see dementia um, as people get older. It's more common in women um, to have Alzheimer's disease. Generally, we'll see a family history and there's genetic factors. 
sorry, that cut off that should say genetic factors. And then there's modifiable. And these modifiable tend to be modifiable, modifiable risk factors for a lot of things, right? So diabetes, obesity, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, cigarette smoking, sedentary lifestyle, depression. So that's different than some of the other things that we talk about when we talk about risk factors. So depression is a symptom, but they also have found links as it being a risk factor. And then sleep disorders. Um, so we want to use agents to treat sleep disorders, teach sleep hygiene, and the benefits of CPAP um, as indicated. So we want individuals to be sleeping well, getting enough rest so that the brain is getting enough rest. Uh, so we definitely want to treat those modifiable risk factors. So prevention, healthy lifestyle, diet, smoking cessation, exercise, stress management, alcohol in moderation, social engagement is really important, keeping that brain active. So people who are out having conversations, people who are out, you know, playing bingo as they get older, or, you know, um, you'll have some people go out and play cards or uh, I can't think of the one game. Is it Marjan? Stuff like that. Getting people out and active and doing thing, things is really important um, for the brain health. So exercise the cognitive function. So puzzles are really good. Um, and then seek appropriate treatment for depression and sleep disorders. So if you have an individual patient that is suffering from um, you know, depression or sleep disorders, you definitely want to have those treated. Clinical manifestation, you will have what starts as a subtle memory loss that progresses. So, you know, we all have days where we may not have slept well or we're so overwhelmed with schoolwork that we can't remember where our keys are. Or, you know, I look at my kids sometimes and I call them my dog's names and I call my dogs my kids' names, you know. So there's some things that, you know, with the busyness of life, things can be normal. But what you will see with individuals is that it's a constant, continual thing, and it starts to progress. And I'll tell you that there are a lot of patients out there. I shouldn't even say patients. I shouldn't refer to them as patients. There are a lot of individuals out there who know how to hide their symptoms. And so it may be hard in the early stages to even recognize that they're having some of these symptoms. Um, so in the beginning, difficulty finding words, difficulty performing tasks, um, impaired judgment, which really um, is a safety issue, disorientation to time and place as they progress even further. So they may not know who the president is or what month or year it is, constantly misplacing things, um, changes in mood and personality. Um, so that, as you progress, is... is I gotta tell you, I have a client that I, I case manage in the community and she has Alzheimer's disease and she was um, in her life, I didn't know her prior to this diagnosis, but I've talked to her sister a lot, uh, very independent, fiercely independent, um, I should say. And she wrote books and journals and she's interviewed celebrities. She had this amazing job. She's traveled the world. And, you know, her sister always tells me, oh, she was so artistic and such a good writer. Well, you know, with Alzheimer's disease and the stage that she's in, and she's moderate going towards more late stages, she still has physical functioning, um, but she doesn't remember that part of herself. So you really do start to see that change of personality where you have somebody who is fiercely independent now... Um, I mean, she sometimes doesn't even know who she is. You know, it's that kind of stage. They can have some odd behaviors just because they don't know how to perform a task. Sometimes, like I've seen people put their socks over their shoes um, and do odd things that are out there because they just have very they have a difficult time with tasks. You can see signs of depressions and then the diurnal changes. So we've all heard of sundowning. Um, you can see that. So they become very, very reliant upon caregivers and that leads to caregiver burden. Oops, let me go back here to stages. 
So we'll talk briefly about stages. This becomes really important when you think about the interventions that you want to put into place because there are interventions for early, um, early cognitive deficit that are not going to be appropriate for, you know, more moderate or severe. So when we think about a mild cognitive deficit, so whether the patient has a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or it's just a dementia, maybe they've had a traumatic brain injury where they have memory issues, but they can still function. Basically what we give them in the mild stage is tools, like crutches, so that they can function as independently as possible. So they may have some difficult time learning new information, so we don't wanna throw it at them fast. We wanna take our time with these clients. So if you had a client in the hospital that has some mild uh, cognitive deficits, you would, you would not wanna rush your interventions with that person. And if you had some discharge teaching, you wanna take your time and be patient with that person. Give them, you know, to-do lists, calendars, verbal reminders, routine, routine, routine is so important. So, and you guys, if you work in hospitals, you probably know this, um, and those of you who haven't but will be working in hospitals, I will tell you that when you take individuals that have a mild cognitive deficit, they may function very well at home because it's their environment, they're in their routine, they can function. When you take them out and put them into a hospital, which is a strange environment with noises going off constantly, new people completely off their routine, they are going to be a lot worse and not, they're not going to be able to function as well as they did at home. So whatever you can do to structure their routine in the hospital, you know, try to give them the same staff members if possible, you know, really orient them to the room write your name on the board, remind them every time you go in there, hi, my name is Jody. I am your nurse today. You're on the hospital for this. I am here for this purpose. You know, those verbal cues to help those patients with a mild cognitive deficit. As you get into the moderate, they're going to have a harder time carrying out their ADLs and they can no longer live independently. They have impaired judgment. We're really thinking about safety issues and this could be scary. It's a, it's, you know, you can have a person that can, can actually get up and physically function, but they don't have the judgment uh, to do things safely. So if they're living independently, they, they would forget to leave the oven on or not know how to use the stove and oven correctly. Um, so it puts them at higher risk for hazardous things to happen in the home. For these clients, you know, if they're in the hospital, it's a good thing to keep them close to the nurse's station, frequent checks. Because they're in a moderate stage, but they're going to progress to be even worse in the hospital, this is when you might want a one-to-one -one sitter with that client if you're able to do that. OT, PT, home health aid, respite care, um, which means basically you can take them out of the house for a little bit, put them in like a, an adult um, day home or memory care facility, to give that caregiver a break, um, that's great. And they may need to start thinking about transitioning to skilled nursing facility with, or, or some can go because if they may still be at the stage where they're, they're toileting themselves or at least somewhat getting to the bathroom, um, you know, they might be able to, to live in an assisted living with a, um, memory care. So memory care units are basically locked units. Um, and, and, you know, people will have their own rooms, but they do the rooms in a way to help, you know, uh, the residents that live there identify the rooms. So, for instance, the woman that I am a case manager for in the community, she lives at the lodge at Walk Manor, which is the Jewish home facility. It's a locked-in facility. She has her own apartment, but they leave her door open, and outside her room are a bunch of things that help identify her. So, pictures of her family. Um, her name is on the door, but she's getting to a point where she can't even read that well anymore, but they have items that are hers that help her identify that that is her apartment. Okay. And then they have people in the facility and we'll talk a little bit about reminiscence therapy as we go on, but they have people in the facility that actually play old music. Um, you know, they have old pictures around so they can kind of trigger memories with clients that way. 
So in the moderate stage, you're really going to be thinking about transitioning this person to a higher level of care. When they are in the severe stage, they are now hitting urinary and fecal incontinence, inability to identify their caregivers and friends, um, dramatic uh, personality changes, and then gradual loss of the ability to walk as that motor center of the um, brain is affected. So now you're looking definitely at higher level of care, sniff, um, and palliative care is really good. And you can put palliative care in really in that moderate stage would be totally appropriate. You guys will talk more about palliative care as you get, I think you have a end of life presentation towards the end of the end of the, the content, I think. But basically, if you don't know what palliative care is, a lot of people term it comfort care. I wouldn't say that palliative care is really for any life-threatening illness or chronic illness that really affects a patient's ability to live comfortably. So it creates a safety net, identifies all the providers and players that we need to um, get involved in a client's care, and most importantly, it establishes the goals of care. In other words, if you have somebody who has moderate Alzheimer's disease, you know, have you identified what their wishes are? If they were to have a heart attack and stop breathing or a stroke, are we going to go through and do life-saving measures, and we totally can. That's absolutely something we can do for patients that want that and their families want that, but really establishing those goals and what are your wishes, what are, you know, do you have advanced directives and getting those advanced directives is, is important. So collaboration, you're gonna have the client in the middle and then all the people around that are trying to work together to care for this patient. So um, rehab is big. I mean, you can look at safety. The problem with rehab and PT and OT is PT and OT can establish programs for the, for the client to kind of help that client function, you know, physically and through their ADLs. But the client doesn't really have the ability to remember um, and utilize the things that they've learned. So PT, OT early on, but in later stages when the patient can no longer walk is not really appropriate. Um, volunteers. Volunteers are huge. Um, home health aides, any kind of assistance to help reduce that caregiver burden. Family, social work, social work to help get the services in place that the person needs. Um, so yeah, there's a lot when it comes to these clients. Um, again, I have that client who lives at the lodge, which is the memory care center, and they have, you know, somebody who goes around playing music, they bring in uh, pet therapy, which is another form of reminiscence therapy, which we'll talk about. Um, you know, um, a lot of people in there to help support these clients. So genetic testing, if a patient has early onset, there is a 50-50 chance of inheriting the associated mutation. Okay, 100% probability of inheriting Alzheimer disease if they have the mutation. So they are finding a very strong genetic link. And I have to tell you, so when I was in middle school, so that was a very long time ago, I had a friend and his father was very outgoing. He used to, he used to volunteer and take us like all, like all of us in this youth group skiing. Um, and he was fun and outgoing. And, you know, I remember finding out that he had committed suicide, that my friend's father had committed suicide. And, you know, of course, I was very young at the time and I didn't get it, you know, any of it. But later on found out that th with his note and the reasoning behind his suicide was that his mother had Alzheimer's disease. And he was starting to recognize that he had symptoms of Alzheimer's disease and he did not want to become a burden to his family because um, his mother had suffered with it very young. She had early onset Alzheimer and he was probably in his, at the time, gosh, when I think back of it now, he was probably only in his forties, you know, when this happened and he was starting to see symptoms. So I mentioned that story because I think we have to be very careful with genetic testing in the fact that there is no cure for Alzheimer's disease, okay? It's not like breast cancer where you can go through genetic testing and there are some options 
and there are treatments available for breast cancer. So if somebody goes through and they test for the genetic uh, marker for breast cancer, they know they've had their family, you know, has tested positive, they can make some choices based off on, based off that testing. You know, so with genetic testing for Alzheimer disease, you can have a person go and do it. Maybe they just want to know, and maybe they want to get their affairs in order and make sure that they can plan for the long term of, you know, so that they, you know, have a plan in place for when they can no longer remember. But it's a really hard thing when somebody goes and they find that they find that out that they have the mutation. You know, if they've witnessed their fam family member, you know, struggle with Alzheimer disease, that it's very hard when they find that out and basically. What they can do is they can give some medications that will slow down um, the development of that progression of Alzheimer's disease, but there is no cure. So it's just something to think about. So as a nurse, if a patient um, came to me and they said, you know, my family member had Alzheimer's disease, you know, I'm starting to notice some symptoms. I'd really like to have some genetic testing to know if that, if, you know, I'm, I'm at risk for, for Alzheimer's disease. My response would be to go through genetic counseling, okay? I would never tell somebody, yes, they should, or no, they shouldn't. It's a personal decision, uh, but I do think that they need to be counseled on um, what they can expect and to help them through that process should they come back with that mutation. So there are some drugs out there. Um, I put the ones that are, are used a lot now um, for Alzheimer's disease, and there's always gonna be new ones. So Amy's story, that video that I gave you was actually done um, to help raise money. Um, U of R was helping to raise money for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and I picked that, I love that video so much, and I, I pick it and I tell my husband that I show it like to, to the class because it's so meaningful that my husband actually shot it. So um, he shot that for U of R. And it, it is, like I said, to raise money because there is no cure. We need better treatments. If you see 7 million people by 2025, we really want to find a cure for this. At the very minimum, find better treatments, right? So uh, Aricept is one drug that's out there um, that is used. And basically what it's going to do, um, it's going to slow down progression a little bit. Okay, it's going to improve symptoms such as agitation or depression. Um, there are some side effects to it. I personally have never seen anybody with a bradycardia from it, but it can be there. And it also states that it should be used cautiously in clients with lung problems such as asthma or COPD. Namenda is another one. This one um, works to slow that progression with moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease. So again, there are some medications out there that help. Um, some, they really, I have seen them work very well for some people. At least they seem to because they don't progress as quickly, but, um, you know, stuff out there. So non-pharmacological therapy. These are the things that you really need to think about as a nurse. So for a client with um, earlier stages, okay, is pictures, clocks, routine, consistency, you know, and this is okay for moderate too. Um, here's where you hit, hit the weeds a little bit. So for clients that have more mild case of dementia or Alzheimer's disease, it's okay to give reminders. We want to give reminders. Like I said, you know, if you have that client coming in and they usually function pretty independently at home, you come in and constantly remind them, my name is Jody. I'm your nurse. You're here in the hospital. You give them those reminders. If you have a client who is more moderate to severe and they're telling you something that is completely not right, like I, there at the lodge where I have my, my client there with Alzheimer, there is another client in that facility who several times when I've been there, she walks around and she's probably in her eighties and she'll walk around crying, asking everybody for a phone because she needs to call her mother 
um, her mother, you know, worries so much. She was around in World War One, and if I don't call her and tell her where I am, she's gonna worry. Okay, I don't know this woman, but I can tell you that her mother is no longer with us. Um, you know, she's reverting back to a time when she was a child, and she's looking for her mom. So the last thing I want to say to this woman who is already very upset is to say to her, oh, don't you remember your mother is, has passed away, okay? Because she doesn't know that, and I'm just telling her that, you know, and it might be like her hearing it for the first time. So it's just going to upset her even more. So that's where you have to be really careful between this reality orientation, and then we're going to talk about validation therapy. So reality orientation is really good for the mild to early moderate stages where you can say to a person, this is who I am. This is where you are. You know, you're not upsetting them by saying anything. You're literally just kind of giving them prompts and reminders. If you have clients in later stages where they don't remember that their spouse is dead or their dog is dead or, you know, whatever, um, has happened, just remember that we're going to be dipping into something called validation therapy. So what validation therapy is, is trying to find meaning in a client's behaviors and verbal expression. So in other words, when this one client is walking around crying for her mother, who is obviously no longer with us, my response to her is, you know, I, it, it appears that you're very upset. You know, it sounds like you're very upset. You know, what is it, if you were able to call your mom, you know, what is it that you would tell her? What would make you feel better? Well, I just want her to know that I'm safe. Okay, well, you are in a safe space. Um, I'm here. There are a lot of people here around here to help you. So you are safe. How about we walk and talk a little bit more Maybe tell me a little bit about yourself. So I validated the feeling, the, the fact that she's feeling possibly a bit unsafe and not understanding where she is. Um, maybe feeling that more than the fact that she needs her mom. Like it's not going to help me to say to her, your mom is no longer with us, so stop looking for your mom. <laughs> you know what I mean? So validation there, if you, you know, a client is watering, upset, crying, you know, they're asking to see their spouse or somebody you know is dead. The last thing you want to say is they're dead. Don't do that. What you want to do is draw them out a little bit more. You appear upset, you know. Tell me a little bit about why you're upset, you know. Um, it sounds like, you know, you really need your husband or your mom right now. Tell me a little bit about them. If they were here, what would they say to you? What would they do for you? So it's really just trying to validate what they're saying, draw them out a little bit more so that maybe you can say something or do something that's going to help them with something that they really need. Non-pharmacological therapy, and I gave you guys um, this video to watch as well, and the videos that I gave you are short and they're very, very helpful. This reminiscence therapy, this video is so delightful, you guys will love it, um, is really trying to trigger the brain through old memories that are there, right? So our long-term memory stays much longer than the short term. So we're really trying to trigger that brain by presenting things that would kind of light up the memories from long-term memory. So in this video, they do it through music and it's absolutely beautiful. Uh, it's just beautiful. And they do this for traumatic brain injury clients as well. The other ways that you can do it are scrapbooks, um, music, taste, foods. So when you think of reminiscence therapy, I want you to remember reminiscence therapy with your senses. Sense of smell, sense of hearing, sense of taste, uh, vis visuals, you know, anything like that that can trigger memory. So looking at old pictures, you know, from when they were younger, pictures of their you know, parents, pictures of their siblings. Um, you, so I said bringing in pet therapy could be a type of reminiscence therapy because if a person had a pet, like I'm telling you guys, if you're taking care of me and my, my memory is gone, I have Alzheimer's disease, please bring me pets because I have always had a dog. 
Um, so just that feeling, that touch, that sensation of petting a dog uh, may trigger something with me. The music you might have to play might be a little crazy, you might have to blare some Pearl Jam and, you know, give me a dog and show me some pictures of Disney World. And if that doesn't trigger me, nothing will. So, you know, just you think about what's important to that person. What did they do? What did they love? What's going to trigger them? So when you think of reminiscence therapy, think of the senses. Sense, like again, touch, smell, sight, hearing, all of that stuff, taste. So if they were somebody who was a baker that always baked apple pies and that was their thing, you know, maybe try some apple pie. The nursing process. So you guys can do, like as an assessment, a mini mental on a patient. You know, a good one is, you know, when you go in to assess your patient, maybe you first walk into the room and you you uh, introduce yourself to, to your client. Hi, I'm Jody. How are you? You know, I have to ask you some questions while I'm here, um, but while I'm in the room, I'm also going to listen to your heart and lungs. But right now, what I want to do is I'm going to give you three words. I'm going to tell you three words, and then before I leave the room, um, after I do your full assessment, I'm going to ask you if you remember those three words. Okay, I'm telling you, I probably wouldn't remember the three words, but you know, and you give them three random words, flower, dog, present. And then you just see, you know, at, after your assessment, do they remember those words? Okay, you can ask them to draw a clock and see if they can draw an analog clock with the numbers in the right places. You might be surprised at some of the things that you get when you have, when you ask somebody to do a simple thing like draw an analog clock, okay? So you can do these mental, mini mental exams. What they are going to do, the doctor, the provider, is if a client comes in with some slight confusion, uh, what they are going to do first is rule out everything else, okay? Because we know that urinary tract infections can make people confused. New medications, drops in blood pressure can make people confused. Um, you know, ear infections. Uh, things that maybe their carotid arteries are, you know, uh, they've got stenosis there. They're not getting good perfusion to their brain. So there's a lot of other things that could be causing them to have memory deficits. So they're going to rule everything else out before they, before they come up with a diagnosis such as Alzheimer disease. So drugs and alcohol. So we have dementia, you know, if you see that word there with the red letters, dementia, so they're going to rule out drugs and alcohol. They're going to look at the eyes and the ears. They're going to rule out metabolic disorders, emotional disorders, neurological disorders, trauma or tumors, infection, and the arterial vascular disease. So they're going to rule all of that stuff out, deliver like a mini mental, and they paint this picture of what we think might be going on with this client. As a nurse, you also want to make sure that you're assessing their functional status. You know, are they still able to independently get to the bathroom? Can they dress themselves appropriately? What is their behavior like? Are they agitated? Have they been, um, you know, acting out like hitting people, verbally abusive, any of that stuff? How is the caregiver? Always assess the caregiver status. And how is that caregiver? You know, are you seeing caregiver burden? Um, and then what is their living environment like? You know, and the saddest thing with these clients is that I find is, and not with all, but a lot of times what will happen is if you have a spouse that, you know, you know, maybe you have a couple that has been married for a very, very long time. And I had this happen where, you know, I was taking care of the wife. She had a heart disease, so I was taking care of her for heart stuff. And her husband had moderate stage Alzheimer disease. And she was taking care of him, and it was really impacting her recovery. You know, she had a lot of stuff going on with her heart. She had put him in respite for a while while she was in the hospital and as she was recovering at home. But when he came home, it was really impacting her recovery. A lot of stress, anxiety, physical, because he would fall. Um, she'd have to help him dress, have to help him shower. And her, you know, we talked a lot, I got social work involved and eventually we did get in, um, we got him to a daycare. She wanted him to go to daycare. She still wanted him home at night. So he went to adult daycare, but, um, you know, her reasoning for not wanting a skilled nursing facility is because she promised him 
when he started to have her early symptoms that she would never put him in a nursing home, that she would always take care of him, you know, and we had to talk about that. And I said, you know, at, at the time, I'm sure you meant that. And at the time, if he had known what it was going to look like when you got to this point, he would, he would most likely not want to be a burden to you. So you have to think about that. So there's a lot of guilt, um, but definitely you want to be addressing that caregiver status, the living environment, all that good stuff. Diagnosis and plan. So think about your other concepts that come in when you are caring for somebody who has um, Alzheimer disease, you know, cognition, obviously. That's our primary problem. But we have to think about the other concepts that go along with that. Safety is huge. Mood and affect, mobility, communication, comfort. So think of all of those other things that come in as you're piecing this together. Um, communication. So if they're having trouble communicating, you know, how are you going to start, you know, finding out what they need? You can try speech therapy sometimes. Speech therapy will work with um, clients with brain disorders strokes, traumatic brain injuries, and sometimes they can use pictures and find ways to communicate with clients so they might be helpful, you know, comfort, can they communicate their pain, um, that type of thing. Mobility becomes huge in the later stages because as, as you can see in the Amy's story, it progresses to a point where she can't physically get up independently anymore. Um, so looking at that stuff. So implementation, so we think about mobility impairments as they progress into later stages and um, cognitive as well. So for mobility, you wanna ambulate with the client if they're at fall risk, turn in position if they can no longer turn in position themselves, clutter free rooms. Okay, this is all the, our fall precautions, right? Avoid scatter rugs, at, especially at home. I had a client who, I swear to God, had about 50 area and scatter rugs in her home. Um, avoid scatter rugs, shoes or non-skid socks, PTOT referral, bed alarms. My problem with bed alarms is that if you have a bed alarm going off, it means that the person is likely already on the floor. So for me, I always say frequent checks. And I know staffing everywhere is horrible. And I know that, you know, the hospitals are not going to pay for sitters constantly. But, you know, check-ins with these clients, frequent supervision, putting them close to the nursing station are going to work so much better than a bed alarm that's just going to tell you they're on the floor. Um, cognitive impairment. So provide cognitive stimulation, music, puzzles, uh, maintain regular routine, orientation clocks, calendars bed near window, consistency, um, and minimal distractions. Take your time with these. And then as they progress into the later stages, you'll be looking at the validation and the reminiscence therapy. So for what we want to do for goals with these clients is we want to keep them as independent as possible for as long as possible. We want to keep them safe and injury free, and we want to prevent and manage that caregiver burden. Um, and that is it. So again, you have this, you have your book, um, and then I gave you the couple videos. I definitely want you to watch Amy's story participate in the discussion board if you haven't already regarding those questions definitely tap into the validation and reminiscence therapy videos and please 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 reach out if you have any questions all right thanks guys